When my wife approached me with an unexpected request, asking for permission to cheat on me, I was overcome with shock and anger. How could she propose such a thing after 20 years of marriage? In that moment, it was clear that decisive action was necessary. In hindsight, perhaps I should have seen it coming. Life had seemed too perfect, especially at that particular moment. It was a serene Friday evening, the air filled with the warmth of a delightful summer day. I sipped on my cold later, enjoying the refreshing sensation as it quenched my thirst. The Cubs were dominating the Cardinals on the large screen, leading 7-2 in the fifth inning. My faithful German shepherd, Hunter, lay beside my recliner, mostly asleep but stirring slightly whenever I cheered for the Cubs. Apart from the occasional burst of excitement from the game, the house was peaceful. My wife of 20 years, Grace, was visiting a neighbor, and our 17-year-old son and 16-year-old daughter were spending the night at their friends' homes. It was just me, Hunter, the Cubs, and a case of Lager in the fridge. Oh, and some limes, I had grabbed a couple earlier in the day, intending to treat myself to a relaxing evening alone. I heard the front screen door creak open and shut, assuming it was my wife returning from her visit with her longtime friend April. Despite hearing movement in the front of the house, I noticed the absence of her usual greeting, which struck me as odd. However, my focus shifted when Cubs manager David Ross made a controversial decision, triggering my eruption of anger and once again disturbing the dog. It took at least seven minutes before Grace finally entered the family room. She appeared contemplative, perhaps anxious, instead of approaching for our customary kiss. Seating herself on the edge of the sofa beside my chair, she kept one eye on me while I remained engrossed in the game. Can we talk for a minute, Adam? She asked, her voice barely audible over the television. Her words immediately captured my full attention. Of course, Bundy, I replied. I noticed a faint sheen of sweat on her forehead and observed her irregular breathing. I pondered whether someone we knew was unwell or had passed away. Could you turn off the TV? She requested, her fists clenching and unclenching. The significance of her request was not lost on me. Turning off the TV during a Cubs game meant it had to be something serious, possibly more than just illness, perhaps even death. A sense of unease settled in the pit of my stomach. I reached for the remote and silenced the television. What's wrong, honey? You don't seem well. Has someone passed away? I inquired, concern evident in my voice. Oh God, no, nobody has died, she responded quickly. It's just that this is incredibly important to me, and I need to ensure you're fully attentive. I nodded silently, my mind flooded with troubling thoughts. As we locked eyes for what felt like an eternity, I could sense fear in her gaze, along with something else, perhaps anger. You know, I love you completely, and I would never betray you. Never be unfaithful with another man, right? Her unexpected question caught me off guard. The dinner I had earlier in the evening and the two beers I drank during the game seemed to threaten to resurface right then and there on the family room floor. I nodded silently once more. I'm 44, Adam. Besides you, I've only been with one other man in my entire life, she began. I still turn heads. My friends even call me a hot mill. I want to be with another man. Just once, to experience the excitement of someone new someone different before we grow old together. I remained motionless, unable to discern how long it had been, as though a rushing train whizzed by my ears. No, absolutely not. I shouted as I leaped from my seat. This won't happen while I'm still breathing. She watched me with wide eyes as I paced back and forth, the situation feeling like a dreadful nightmare. It was as if I had slipped into a twisted dream while dozing off in my chair. This isn't about you and me, Adam. It's about me, my personal needs that go beyond our family, she asserted, her voice growing stronger with each word. I believe I've been a devoted wife and mother all these years. I've always prioritized the family, but now just this once, I need to do something for myself. I need to feel like a confident, desirable woman in control of her own life. Do you not feel desirable with me? 
I asked, realizing how pathetic I sounded. I express my love for you constantly. I believe I consistently make you feel desired. I still crave you, and I don't think I'm subtle about it. You do, and I appreciate that. But this is about something else, she replied firmly. I still crave validation from my ego from men other than you, Adam. It's gratifying to be noticed by other men. It's exhilarating to imagine that another man desires me in that way. Doesn't it make you feel good when you catch a woman looking at you or flirting with you? I'm not unlike anyone else. I enjoy being looked at, desired. And after all this time, I desire nothing more than that. I yearn for the experience of going out on a date, being treated to dinner and wine, then pursued and desired by a different man. Just for one night, not for love, just for desire. One night, and then I would return home to you and be yours, be devoted wife and mother for the rest of my days. You're far more than just a devoted wife and mother to me, I counted. You're my everything. I can't bear the thought of you being with another man. I refuse to let you go to another man. You keep saying you love me. Why not demonstrate your love by granting me this? I know it's a lot to ask. Perhaps the biggest ask, and it would mean everything to me if you were to allow it, she insisted. No, it would be the ultimate foolishness for me to agree to that. If you truly love me, you wouldn't have even brought it up, I replied. Haven't I been a decent husband to you and a good father to our children? Shouldn't that earn me some leeway too? And you had so many more partners than I did before we got married. I'm just trying to level the playing field a bit. Actually, we never discussed numbers before we got married. All we really talked about was our mutual belief in fidelity after marriage. And just so you know, I've only been intimate with four women in my life, including you. So it's not exactly a long list, I explained. Oh, I always assumed you had much more experience than me, she admitted. You seem to know so much more than I do. I've done a lot of reading on the subject. I want to make you happy in every way I can. So, you're still firmly against it, she inquired. Not only am I firmly against it, but I'll be contacting a lawyer first thing Monday morning to begin divorce proceedings. I declared, noting the shock on her face. But, but, she stuttered. I understand this must have been difficult for you to ask for, which tells me you're serious about it. That also tells me you won't give up easily, I said my tone resolute. It means you might eventually try to do it behind my back. I no longer trust you not to, unless you've already done so. And this could be just a way to seek permission after the fact. No, I swear, I haven't been with anyone else. I promised I wouldn't cheat on you. And I meant it, she pleaded. But now that I know you want to, you might see it as not cheating. Since you've asked, I stated firmly, locking eyes with her. Her avoidance of eye contact conveyed all the information I needed. Are you really willing to tear apart our family? Even though I haven't done anything yet, she questioned, her voice hoarse. If you've mustered the courage to ask, it suggests you've been contemplating this for a while. And that indicates you already have someone in mind. Perhaps he's been involved in the planning too, lunches, dinners. Emotionally, you've already betrayed me. By the way, who is he? I inquired. I didn't have anyone specific in mind, she replied, her gaze fixed on a spot on the wall behind me. The silence stretched for about 20 seconds as I bore into her with my stare. She flushed crimson when she met my eyes, registering my disbelief. You don't need to know, Adam, she murmured. Technically, no, I don't, but I'm curious about the man who's dismantling what I thought was a strong marriage. You can tell me, or I can reach out to all your close friends, your boss, and every co-worker, I threatened. Her jaw dropped in astonishment. You wouldn't, she began. Wouldn't I? What do I have left to lose? My life's already in shambles. My marriage shattered. A little embarrassment hardly matters to me. What about my embarrassment? She exclaimed. I shrugged, making an effort to conceal my smile. What's your name? I inquired sternly. Larry Hayes, she responded softly. Please, Adam, don't harm him. 
I make no promises, I stated, reaching for the remote and resuming the game. She huffed, holding back tears, got up from the couch, and headed upstairs to our bedroom. I sat glued to the Cubs game, but my mind was elsewhere. I couldn't recall what aired on TV afterward, but I remained in front of the screen for at least another two hours. Despite my efforts to conceal my emotions from my wife, the truth was, I felt utterly devastated. I had no inkling that she was contemplating being unfaithful. Looking back, I realized I should have noticed signs of her discontent with me or our life together. Over the past three months, Grace had become increasingly distant, not only from me, but also from our children. In fact, it was our daughter, Nancy, who first noticed it, asking if Grace and I had been in some sort of disagreement, as the closeness between us seemed to have diminished. I also observed a decline in our frequency of sexual intimacy, which used to be two or three times a week, but had decreased to once every other week. Despite my efforts, I began to wonder if she might be experiencing some early changes. Furthermore, there were instances of her taking phone calls outside of the room, which was a new behavior, along with nearly constant late-night texting. When I asked about it, she attributed it to April, who supposedly was dealing with issues in her marriage with Jack. This intrigued me, as Jack and April lived just three doors down from us, and I had no idea they were encountering any problems over the weekend. I dedicated considerable thought to my available choices. I informed Grace of my intention to initiate divorce proceedings promptly, but before doing so, I needed to thoroughly evaluate every aspect of my marriage and family. It wasn't difficult to comprehend why other men might be attracted to Grace. I first met her when we were both 20, and even at 44, she had only gained 11 pounds despite having two children. Her attractive figure, complemented by ample breasts and a firm buttock, along with her youthful appearance, made her seem closer to 35. I often pondered how I ended up with Grace, considering she was clearly out of my league, although I'm not unattractive. Men like me don't typically end up with someone who was a prom queen just three years prior in high school. Our paths crossed in a physics class at university during my junior year. While I was taking it for enjoyment, Grace needed it to fulfill her science requirement. Being somewhat of a geek, I was more than willing to assist her in passing the class, knowing that science wasn't her fort. As the first semester drew to a close, we'd found ourselves studying in my dorm room when Grace suddenly leaned in and kissed me passionately. I reciprocated the kiss with equal intensity. Damn, for most of the semester, I thought you were gay, Grace remarked after we broke the kiss. No matter what I did, you never seemed interested. I was definitely interested, but I had no clue it was mutual. I was just trying my best not to drool over you, I replied. We immediately entered into an exclusive relationship. My experience in bed was limited, but it seemed to be even more important to her, as she never complained and seemed to enjoy everything I tried, thanks to my extensive reading on the subject. While my peers were interested in adult films, I studied the depicted actions. This knowledge proved useful to Grace from the very beginning. During our second intimate encounter, I managed to make her pass out with a language technique. When she regained consciousness three minutes later, all she could say was, I love you, Adam. Two and a half years after graduation, we were married. Three and a half years later, our son was born, and then our daughter. Financially, we were doing well. I worked in it, and she was a banker. When she returned to work after our youngest started school, our son was preparing to start his freshman year at Ohio State in a couple of months, while our daughter was about to enter her senior year of high school. In just two years, we would be empty nesters. We've been discussing our future plans, including travel, for the past few months. I had been in love with this woman for nearly 24 years. On one hand, ending it all because she requested permission to cheat seemed overly severe. But on the other hand, her reaching the point of asking was a significant issue. I wasn't naive. I understood that if she was desperate enough to seek permission to cheat, she might resort to doing so behind my back, especially since she disclosed it to me and didn't perceive it as cheating, though I did. Moreover, 
There was the issue of her already engaging in an emotional affair with Larry Hayes and planning this act of physical infidelity together. Could I ever forgive that? I immediately contacted a divorce attorney on Monday morning and scheduled an appointment for that Thursday afternoon. Meanwhile, Grace attempted to convince me against filing for divorce. We haven't done anything, Adam. We won't, Grace pleaded. Is it because you genuinely don't want a divorce or because you know it's wrong? I inquired. She avoided eye contact and remained silent. You're still hoping I'll change my mind and allow it, aren't you? Her hopeful expression sadly confirmed our inevitable fates. Grace was served with divorce papers a week after meeting with my attorney. We resided in a no-fault state and had similar incomes, simplifying the financial aspects with the children. Arrangements for our nearly grown children would be made gradually, with the non-custodial parent responsible for child support for a year. The plan was to sell the house and divide the proceeds, wrapping up our 20-year marriage. However, things didn't proceed as smoothly as anticipated. Grace retained a skilled attorney who persuaded the judge to mandate four counseling sessions with the possibility of more if deemed necessary. The counselor, a woman in her mid-thirties, shared the viewpoint of my children and Grace. If my wife hadn't committed adultery, why was divorce deemed necessary by me? I relayed to the counselor the same sentiment I shared with Grace and my children. I viewed her proposition for extramarital relations as a breach of our marital vows. As a result, I no longer felt I could trust her as my spouse. Though I may still harbor some love for her, I couldn't remain married to someone I couldn't trust. I won't ever entertain such an idea again, Adam. I only need you, please. Throughout the majority of two counseling sessions, she implored repeatedly, you're set in your decision, aren't you, Mr. Griffin? Your conviction is clear in your ease, remarked the counselor toward the conclusion of the second session. I will cease prolonging this charity and advise the judge to proceed with the divorce unimpeded. While my personal opinion holds no weight, I'll offer it. Nonetheless, I believe you're making a grave error here. Your wife hasn't engaged in infidelity, at least not physically. So it appears that marriage counseling would be welcome to salvage your long-standing relationship. Your wife appears willing to make any concessions necessary to preserve your marriage and your family Dr. Dyers expressed. I admitted, grimacing aside, that my affection for Grace ran deep. This decision wasn't made lightly. Dr. Dyers, there's a disparity in our perspectives. You labeled it a concession, but I don't see her commitment to fidelity as such. It's about honoring the vows we exchanged 20 years ago. Vows she conspired to violate with another man. I clarified that the news of our divorce sent my in-laws into a frenzy. The day after Grace informed them, my mother-in-law phoned me and launched into a tirade, hurling insults for a solid 20 minutes without pause the moment I answered. My father-in-law, usually the voice of reason, wrested the phone from her midst, but her shouting continued. She never even betrayed you, and you're ending it after 20 years. Are you out of your mind, Adam? He bellowed. I recounted the sequence of events to him, and throughout, I could discern his stifled reactions. Occasionally, he would interject with a subdued really before I resumed. By the end of our conversation, he appeared diminished in spirit, with a final apology. He quietly ended the call. The following week, I relocated to a nearby two-bedroom apartment, while my daughter chose to remain with my wife until she started college. The following year, I thought the extra room might prove useful if either of the kids wanted to stay over. Despite understanding my reasons for divorcing their mother, both children were upset with me. A few days after settling into my new place, I had a cordial phone chat with my neighbor, Jack. I informed him that his wife, April, seemed to have played a role in my wife's plans with Larry Hayes, as Grace had mentioned. I assured Jack that I didn't suspect him of being involved in the breakdown of my marriage. However, it seemed like April might have had a hand in it. Given April's closeness to Grace, I couldn't help but wonder if she was also arranging something with another man. Oh, Dan, Jack muttered on the phone. So you're saying I might be in trouble too? Does your lawyer offer group discounts? The rise of social media has its pros and cons for me. 
One positive aspect was that I could gather plenty of information about Larry Hayes without needing a private investigator, saving me a lot of money. Hayes, a colleague of April's, had moved to our local office from Cleveland around seven months before my marriage fell apart. He had a beautiful fiancé who was still looking for work in our city, so he frequently travelled back to see her on weekends. It seemed he was trying to arrange something with my wife for when he was in town, so that he could have a warm welcome in both places. I wondered if Grace was even aware of Hayes' fiancé. That was all in the past now, except for the call I made to Hayes' fiancé soon after. I received word from several sources that Larry's wedding had been called off. His fiancé expressed that he was free to be with his old lady full-time. Did I mention that his fiancé was the daughter of a very wealthy man? Two weeks before my divorce was finalised marked my 21st anniversary with Grace. I couldn't deny the pain of what I had lost. But as I sat in front of my Swanson tea dinner, the more convinced I became that I was making the right choice for myself. Remaining married with a mental lifetime of suspicion and searching for signs of her infidelity. I was certain deep down that she would inevitably find a way to betray me. She couldn't stand losing and would view not getting her way as a defeat. That needed correcting. I took a sip of single malt and retired to bed by 11 o'clock p.m. happy anniversary to me. Around 2 o'clock in the morning, my phone rang and I realized that my future ex-wife was calling. At first, I wanted to transfer the call to voicemail, but I decided to answer because I was already awake and breathing heavily. Clearly, in the midst of lovemaking, familiar with these sounds, I knew she wasn't faking it. Despite wanting to hang up, I found I couldn't move while listening to Grace encouraging her partner, presumably Hayes. I stayed on the line for another few minutes, long enough to hear them finish. I wished I had a landline phone so she could hear the phone clap. All my doubts about our impending divorce disappeared at that moment. Following the advice of my lawyer, I had developed a habit of recording all conversations with my wife. As I sat there, my nerves on edge, I dialed my in-law's number. When my father-in-law answered, I played back the three-minute recording for him before ending the call. I was confident there would be no repeat performances of that unpleasant exchange in the future. Unlike my wife, I didn't seek solace in the company of others until after the divorce was finalized. Even then, it was over a year before I took another woman to bed. Admittedly, my social life suffered. It had been 24 years since my last date, and with no intention of dating again, I hadn't kept up with the scene. That turned out to be a grave mistake, as the dating world had evolved rapidly, leaving me behind. I acknowledged that part of my hesitation to date stemmed from fear. I dreaded the possibility of another emotional blow. I had loved Grace deeply, and her betrayal blindsided me completely without even a warning. One noticeable change I observed since my last stint in the dating world was the shift in women's attitudes. Back then, it was typically one-sided. The man took the lead, choosing who to pursue, asking them out, planning the date, and footing the bill. Nowadays, it seems like women are taking on more assertive roles in dating, sometimes initiating the pursuit themselves and having opinions on how the date should unfold. They even occasionally contribute financially at times. I felt like a relic trying to keep up with the pace of modern dating dynamics. Being back in the dating scene revealed to me that Grace's selfishness wasn't an anomaly, but rather part of this newfound empowerment. In today's dating scene, women seem more focused on fulfilling their own desires, sometimes at the expense of their partners. It's a mentality that I've encountered all too frequently, and it's a recent development that I've witnessed firsthand. I won't deny the physical sign of intimacy with a 20-year-old woman. Certainly, it was quite intense at first, and I thought I might have strained a couple of muscles. However, once I adjusted to the physical demands, the pleasure became credible. I don't want to discredit Grace's abilities in bed, but at 44, she couldn't match the energy and flexibility of a young woman. Admittedly, I didn't have the stamina of a young man either, but I made up for it with my tongue and finger skills, which were my fort. However, I wasn't solely interested in younger partners. I've had experiences with women between the ages of 30 and 50. 
I can say that I am open to all ages. However, I usually gravitated towards women of my age, with whom I felt most comfortable. After enduring a challenging week, I concluded a meeting with a new client situated on the distant side of town, still dressed in my business suit. Deciding to take a breather, I made a pit stop at the bar of a posh hotel restaurant. Perched on a tall stool, I ordered a shot of Glen Morangi single malt. It was around 8 o'clock when I arrived, and approximately an hour later, a lively group of women from a bachelorette party claimed a cluster of reserved tables. Their group comprised roughly 20 individuals, and they were exuding quite a bit of energy. Intrigued, I decided to stay a while longer and enjoy the spectacle, ordering a meal to be served at the bar. Predictably, the bride-to-be commanded the spotlight. A fetching young woman of approximately 27 years old with cascading, light brown locks and expressive brown eyes. Admittedly, I have a soft spot for long hair, so I found myself captivated by her, focusing on her for several minutes before diverting my attention to the rest of the party. It was then that I noticed her counterpart, a woman I estimated to be around 43 years old. Judging by her demeanor, she appeared to be the designated chaperone, the older guardian brought along to oversee the antics of both the innocent and not-so-innocent younger attendees. Upon first observation, she appeared somewhat restless in her mid-thigh-length black skirt, which seemed to be creeping up her legs as she sat. She attempted to readjust it several times in the initial moments, albeit unsuccessfully. I couldn't help but smile inwardly. She indeed possessed attractive legs. Moreover, she seemed to have a prominent bosom, not entirely concealed beneath the snug turquoise silk blouse she wore. The blouse boasted a modest V-neck, its neckline descending and revealing her seldom sun-exposed alabaster skin. Her ensemble perhaps leaned towards a younger demographic than she might typically opt for, suggesting it might have been chosen by one of the younger women in the group. I silently commended whoever selected and encouraged her to wear it. The women appeared to be thoroughly enjoying themselves, engaged in laughter, libations and refreshments, as a four-piece ensemble commenced playing. Several women rose to dance with one another. This display of women dancing together seemed to embolden other men in the bar, who gradually approached the women on the dance floor and those seated at tables, except for their chaperone. After waiting for approximately 15 minutes, without anyone approaching the chaperone, I determined it was safe and approached her, noting her dark brown shoulder-length hair and bright green eyes. Equally noteworthy was the absence of a wedding ring on her finger. A lovely shade of pink flushed her cheeks when I invited her to dance. Initially hesitant, she eventually agreed despite receiving teasing remarks from nearby Lambe women. As she stood up, adjusted her skirt, and took my hand, I silently thanked my ex-wife for insisting I learn how to dance. The first two dances were lively, and I was pleasantly surprised when she leaned into me during a subsequent slow dance. Her hair carried the scent of white shoulders, which amused me as it's not typically favored by younger women. As we moved across the dance floor, we engaged in conversation, and I learned her name was Abigail Russell. She was the bride's aunt and served as the group's chaperone. After thanking me for the dances, Abigail began to leave the dance floor following the slow dance. However, I held onto her hand and invited her to join me at the bar. She initially protested, citing the need to watch her girls. But I pointed out that she could still keep an eye on them from our vantage point of the bar. Reluctantly, she agreed, and we observed the younger women while engaging in conversation. I discovered that she was actually 49 years old and had undergone a divorce after a 16-year marriage. She shared with me that her ex-husband, a wealthy man, had replaced her with a younger wife, who was 28 at the time of their marriage 3.5 years ago. She also mentioned that her attire was chosen by her niece, the bride, and she felt it was a bit youthful for her usual conservative style. I expressed my opinion that her outfit suited her perfectly, and I may have indulged in some flattery when I praised her attractive heels. Over the years, I had learned that women often appreciated compliments on their shoes. Do you think I look out of place in this outfit? She innocently asked. Not at all. 
Excuse my directness, but you look absolutely stunning, I replied. If I had appreciated her pink-blue shirley ear, I was even more enamored by the deep red blush she displayed. We chatted for approximately 20 minutes, during which she observed that I wasn't wearing a wedding ring and was curious about the story behind it. She seemed surprised when I mentioned that my ex-wife had never physically cheated on me. I'm quite traditional, I clarified. She betrayed me emotionally and was planning to do so physically. I couldn't trust her anymore. You can't claim to love someone while desiring someone else sexually. I understand, she responded. Everyone has their own boundaries. A few minutes later, she returned to the bridal party table. But she was still open when I asked her to dance again. About 25 minutes later, this time, after we finished, she took my hand and guided me back to the table, where the other women were seated, now joined by several other men. The evening turned out to be a success from my perspective. Despite the lively behavior of some of the younger women, I was pleasantly surprised when Abigail asked me to be her date at the wedding in three weeks. I was originally planning to attend solo, but I believe I have a better time with you, she explained. Although we've only just met, you've already acquainted yourself with many of the other guests who will be present. Plus, it would be a huge favor to me because I really wouldn't want to be there alone looking terribly pathetic. I certainly wouldn't want you to feel that way. I'd be more than happy to accompany you to the wedding. I replied, just let me know what color you'll be wearing and I'll select a suit that compliments it. She leaned in and planted a quick kiss on my lips. Ooh la la teased. As voices from the end of the table caught my attention, I grinned, noticing Abigail's blush once more. I found myself enjoying her reaction, savoring the moment. While not dancing, I sat with Abigail at one point, keeping a watchful eye on the bachelorette party attendees. Some of them were visibly overindulging in alcohol. As the father of a teenage girl, it was only natural for me to adopt a protective stance. My attention was suddenly drawn when I observed a young man guiding one of the girls towards the restroom. Politely excusing myself from the table, I swiftly and discreetly intervened, arriving just in time to intercept the young man before he could usher the girl into the men's restroom. The young man regarded me with contempt, evidently unimpressed by an older gentleman in formal attire intervening in the party. I hardly struck fear into anyone at first glance. Nevertheless, I'd like to believe I'm still in decent physical condition, having endured my fair share of hardships in my youth. Sometimes readiness for unexpected confrontations is necessary to do what's right, like protecting a young girl from becoming a victim. I hoped someone would intervene to shield my own daughter if the situation demanded it. Let go of my hand and back off, old timer, he snarled at me. She's old enough to handle herself if she wants to. I released his hand, but with my other hand, I held his head tightly and slammed it hard against the wall next to the door. The impact was strong enough to crack the drywall, stunning him momentarily. Suddenly, his confidence seemed to vanish, and he loosened his grip on the girl. It appeared he no longer wanted to escalate the conflict. The atmosphere in the club grew quieter as bystanders noticed the altercation. Abigail and the rest of our group approached us, gently guiding the woman back to our table. As I braced myself to face the restaurant manager and other employees, fearing potential reprimand, I was surprised by their response. To my relief, the manager extended gratitude for my intervention and assistance to the young woman. The authorities have been contacted. This individual is being taken into custody, he informed me. They will likely request your details and your version of events, but I believe you have nothing to worry about. By the way, your drinks for the remainder of the party are complimentary. Thank you once again. Returning to the table, Emily, the bride-to-be, remarked on the ordeal. Thank you for being attentive to more than just Abigail, she said. Abigail, curious, asked how I had noticed the situation. I'm supposed to be keeping an eye out, but I was completely oblivious. I feel terrible about it, she admitted. Don't blame yourself. It's easy to lose track of 15 girls in a bar if you're not a professional security guard or a dad. I reassured her with a smile. 
Engaging in conversation and banter with the ladies at the table, I savoured the camaraderie until they decided to move elsewhere for the rest of their evening, bidding us good night. Sharing a gentle kiss with Abigail, I felt a sense of contentment, knowing I had her contact information saved in my phone. Find a private space, one of the girls quipped, prompting laughter from the group. Observing the women depart from the restaurant, I lightly licked my lips, savoring the hint of Abigail's lipstick. Returning to my original spot at the bar with my drink, the bartender remarked, Looks like things went well for you. Who would have thought? I replied with a laugh, a bachelorette party. Give me one more drink to toast my good fortune before I bid farewell to my newfound companion. The bartender received a generous $20 tip for the evening. Abigail donned a light blue dress for the wedding, so I opted for my dark blue pinstripe suit, which I considered my own form of attire. Together, we made quite the dashing pair, receiving nods of approval from several of her relatives throughout the wedding. Numerous individuals approached me to express gratitude for watching over Abigail. Evidently, the bride had been recounting my deeds as if I were some sort of hero for the past two weeks. Heroic and handsome, what a delightful combination, remarked Abigail's sister Mia as she gracefully approached us to introduce herself before the ceremony. Thank you for assisting the girls a few weeks back and for elevating my sister's taste in men, added Ava, the mother of the bride. During our conversation, I had the chance to meet Abigail's 24-year-old daughter, Emily, and her fiance, Ethan. Upon our introduction, Emily remarked, Well, at least one of my parents isn't searching for dates at an elementary school. By the end of the reception, I felt assured that Abigail and I had a future together. A month later, I introduced her to my children. While my son quickly warmed up to her, my daughter remained somewhat distant, harboring resentment towards me for divorcing her mother, despite her mother not having cheated on me. However, my son understood the situation. He had a serious girlfriend of his own. We had an in-depth conversation about fidelity and its importance to each of us. When we retired a few years later, Abigail and I celebrated our next anniversary with a cruise on the seas and oceans, performing daily intimate rituals to strengthen our bond. At our stage in life, it is more about developing a connection than purely physical intimacy. All three of our children have since tied the knot and are thriving, blessing us with a total of six grandchildren. I've had occasional conversations with my ex-wife since our divorce, mostly during our children's weddings and holiday gatherings. She's since remarried and divorced again, often attributing her circumstances to me. She asserts to our children, some people are simply incapable of understanding what faithfulness is. Feel free to leave a comment on how you like this story, friends.